Welcome to Discourse, I am Susil Pandey. Nepal is drafting a new constitution now. However, political parties are yet to make consensus on state restructuring, forms of governance, judiciary, and electoral system. So far as state restructuring is concerned, the issue of identity is one of the most contentious issues. Today, we are going to talk with Professor Dr. Sanjeev Upreti on what is identity politics and how should political parties deal with it. Welcome to the show, Professor Upreti. Thank you. What is the identity politics in the context of Nepal? Oh, you know, identity politics has been going on in the contemporary world for a long time. Uh, uh, due to the pressures of globalization, because globalization is supposed to make everything very similar, very homogeneous. In that context, around the world, there is this tendency that uh, we should show, also show our difference, not be the same as globalization promises, but also you know, create our own identity, which is different. So in that sense, uh, identity politics is global. Mm -hmm. In the context of Nepal, because there is an increasing uh, awareness regarding uh, in the context of various because Nepal has various ethnic communities mm -hmm. like uh, people from the caste mm -hmm. system and people from different geographical reasons now there is this awareness that so far Nepal's nationalism mm -hmm. was very homogeneous the symbols of Nepali nationalism were heavy, very homogeneous drawn from especially upper caste uh, communities of the hills mm -hmm. so now there is this increasing awareness that no no Nepal is also a multicultural country yeah. Nepaliness, Nepaliness, mm -hmm. or Nepal as a nation, mm -hmm. it does not need to be only imagined in homogeneous terms. Yeah. If you look back to the history, the emergence of identity politics, um, we can trace uh, identity politics in Nepal from 1990, and uh, later in the Second People's Movement. After that, the identity politics is, uh, it seems, rising or on the rise and uh, very uh, late now of late people are trying to delineate the some uh, federal states on the basis of identity politics also for example uh, along the lines of ethnicity is that good uh, it's you know like uh, it's a very difficult question to answer in, in, in a certain way because many ethnic communities around around nepal they feel you know dispossessed and there is this entire history behind this Right from the 18th century when Prithvi Narayan Shah unified the country, many ethnic communities whose kingdoms he won, they, f they have gone through this sense of disposition. So mm -hmm. there is a lot of resentment. And uh, in, that, in the context of that resentment, you know, like this uh, demand for ethnic politics, this demand for ethnic feder federal states, you know, it's justifiable to a great extent. But there are, there are also dangers of that. Mm -hmm. How do we manage these, this kind of ethnic politics? So it depends on, you know, like, the question whether it's good or bad, it depends on how do we deal with it. Mm -hmm. then the problem is already there, yeah. how do we deal with it? That's the problem. Then how should political parties deal with such kind of contentious issue? I mean, you know, at a certain level, I feel that since the question has already come up, it needs to be dealt in some way. Mm -hmm. You cannot put history under the carpet, you know. Mm -hmm. At this point, one solution, one, you know, like a very conservative solution would be that, you know, we will make equal laws for everywhere, for everyone. And because the laws are equal, everyone is equal. And for that reason, we do not need to address this ethnic question at all. Mm -hmm. That can be you know, one kind of very conservative perspective. Mm -hmm. However, you know, that might not solve the problem because that ethnic discontent has been there. Not only ethnic discontent, there is discontent in the, you know, in the context of gender also because mm -hmm. women also feel discriminated within the structure of patriarchy. If we do not address these concerns, there might be some kind of a temporary political solution, but these problems, these dissatisfactions, discontents, they are bound to come out in future also. So this needs to be dealt with. But in a very some way. argue that identity politics in itself is a bad politics because it would lead to the country to disintegration or communal class. They argue. I mean, it, it depends on how you take this issue. You know, like. Uh, because traditionally, you know, the way nation has been imagined, or modern nations has, have been imagined, the, mod, the model of nationalism is very homogeneous. E even the way, uh, you know, like uh, 18th century national nations were imagined in Europe, 
the model was very homogeneous. Yeah. The idea was that you know a nation should have a single language, single kind of culture, everyone should speak the same language. The same model was used in the United States also before 1960s. Yeah. The idea that was called a you know, melting pot conception of US. But now, you know, like mm -hmm. so because of that, people who is to answer your question, people who still have that kind of melting pot idea of nationalism, mm -hmm. they feel threatened, you know, when when you talk about multicultural Nepal, multi-ethnic Nepal, multilinguistic -ling Nepal, many people feel threatened. It, they feel that you know this kind of nationalism can lead to sep separatism, but it might not. If you deal with it properly, it might not be necessarily be, be so. Multiculturalism does not necessarily lead to separatism, in my view. Let me know that uh, what is difference between the identity politics that has emerged in uh, European countries and now in Nepal. As I said, yeah. you know, like the way I didn't, you know, nation, nation state was imagined in uh, Europe is very different from you know what's happening here now because we are not talking about multicultural issues but mm -hmm. another, another thing is that you know, like uh, another way specific in the context of Nepal we should not also forget that identity politics identity yeah. and you know identity as such yes, yes. is determined by multiple factors there is not one factor determining identity for example a person can be a bahun or a limbu mm -hmm. You know, male, or, or a Nevar, yeah. you know, that can be, that's the question of ethnicity or caste, mm -hmm. you know, but that can be a man or a woman. That person can be, let's say, homosexual or heterosexual. Yeah. That person, the same person uh, can come from a different geographical region of Nepal. Mm -hmm. Or that person might be abled or let's say differently abled yeah. or somewhat used to be, people mm -hmm. used to call disabled, you know. So the multiple factors are involved in defining identity. There's not one factor eight. It means the person has multiple identity vectors to be identified himself or herself. Of course, of course. There's not only one one vector. There are multiple vectors, and depending upon the context and time, sometimes mm -hmm. you know one vector. For example, in some case, uh, ethnicity might take over. In some case, gender might be more pre pre predominant. So mm -hmm. multiple factors determine identity mm -hmm. rather than a single factor. And these, when we are talking about identity politics, or when we are thinking of restructuring you know, like uh, uh, federal uh, states, uh, we have to take these multiple uh, factors together, not just one factor. Mm -hmm. If we just take ethnicity out, then ethnicity, and if yeah. we ignore class let or me, gender, it, it will lead to Let problems. me know that you are a columnist also, you also write uh, political analyst, analyst also you are a political analyst also, theater actor and a writer. Yeah? You have published a book, you have written a book, Siddhanta Gakura. And why political parties are so much bickering <laughs> on such a contentious issue identity politics or identity as such why what may be the reason behind that you know like uh, one thing is uh, one thing uh, one thing as i've already told you we is, we are still get our leadership leaders they are still carrying within their head this concept of uh, this idea of you know like a very homogeneous nationalism which was invented yeah. in europe but yeah. things have changed and they are not ready to accept that nations can be multicultural. That is mm -hmm. one thing. But the second thing is that, you know, like, uh, if you look at the leadership of the political parties, most of them are coming from upper caste, bound, and chetri backgrounds. So obviously, you know, like, uh, maybe there is some kind of mental blockage. I don't know. Mm -hmm. This is something that everyone has to ask ourselves. You know, for example, if you are born at a, in a certain caste, yeah. you acquire certain benefits. For example, I, I, I'm, a, I'm born in a Brahmin family. Mm. I'm also a man. So obviously, you know, without me doing anything, yeah. I have reaped benefits from the system, you know. Because you are a male? Yes, in of male course. In a male-dominated society, and a Brahmin, and because of that, you reaped many benefits from the state? Did, definitely, you know, not consciously, but, but those benefits came to me yeah. automatically. But, you know, the th problem is that Many people are not aware of the benefits they are gaining automatically. Mm. This is something we have to think, you know. Then have the to, have to question is, how can we distribute such kind of benefit that the state provides to all people equally? That's the question. I mean, that is what is, there are certain theorists named uh, uh, Paul Farmer and John Galton. They have you know, coined a term called structural violence. Yeah. Structural violence is not a violence that one person does consciously. But it's the, it is the structure that itself commits violence. Yeah. Society the itself is, commits society violence. Itself. And because that structural violence has a kind of a historical background, it does not happen in 10 years or 100 years. It happens over hundreds of years. Yeah. Certain structure develops. And those people, some people who are at the bottom of that structure, you know, they get 
underprivileged. On the other hand, people who get automatic benefit if they are at a, in a certain point of the structure, for example, yeah. being a man or a bown mm -hmm. or you know, like abled person, mm -hmm. you know, you are automatically get in you know, a certain kind of benefit. But the, the thing is that, you know, like those people who are in the position of power, they need to be aware of, you know, and ask themselves certain difficult questions, ask themselves what kind of benefits we have reaped yeah. by being in a certain point in the structure. Are we automatically getting some benefit? If they start asking themselves such difficult questions, I think they'll be more empathetic or sympathetic mm -hmm. towards the people who are who are at the bottom of the structure, mm -hmm. people who are, are not privileged like them. No, no, how can you convince them, as you said? Can you convince them or uh, state can do something for those people who are marginalized? I mean, the one thing, you know, like eventually, I think we will come to that. You know, like Nepal. It may take some Nepal, time. Nepal, same, some time. But, but my view, you know, my honest yeah. view is that because you know, some people have been suffering or some people are underprivileged just because they are born into as a particular gender, as a woman, yeah. or or even like a third gender, or if they are very poor, or they, if they belong to a certain ethnicity, because of that, if they are suffering yeah. this burden of history yeah. for such a long time, mm -hmm. then you know, like. One way to address their problem is to, of course, the first thing is to promote their uh, cultures, their histories, their literatures. Yeah. You know, that is one thing. But the second thing at a practical level is to, you know, maybe to move towards you know, some kind of, you know, what, what we call positive discrimination or some kind of reservation system. Preferential also. right. Also. Preferential right, of course. And the, we should be very careful about these preferen preferential right or positive discrimination. But it is a matter of, it's still a matter of great dispute among political parties. Because some say that, that that such kind of positive discrimination or preferential, preferential rights, as we said, that may lead, that may push another group of people in the society to the corner. You see, the, the question of you know, prefer preferential rights or positive discrimination, what you call it, this is not an ideal solution, of course. In an ideal society, there should not be any discrimination at all, neither positive nor po negative. Yeah. You know? But if some people are suffering just because they are born into a certain ethnic group or you know, being born as a woman yeah. or being born in a particular geographical situation. Mm -hmm. And since that that exploitation, that marginalization has been happening over the centuries, then, you know, uh, positive discrimination for a certain limited period of time yes. that is necessary. But that needs to be monitored constantly. And as I said, ideally, there should not be any uh, reservation at all. But since there That's is so much mismatch in the society, there is so much discrimination in the society, there is so much, as I was saying, structural violence in the society, in order to deal that, we deal with that, you know, there should be some kind of reservation system. If that is done for a certain period of time, by, with constant monitoring, I think I'm fine well, with that. What do you think? Is that appropriate way to resolve the structural violence? That's one way, as I said, this is not an ideal method, we are not, but we are not living in an ideal world. We are living in a world where there is a lot of discrimination, there is a lot of violence. In order to deal with that, yeah. I think uh, this can be done for a kind of a uh, temporary basis. But at the same time, yeah. you know, if you introduce a system like, you know, like positive discrimination or reservation system, whatever, you know, like, uh, again, we have to look at it from multiple angles, from multiple coordinates. For example, you know, like those who are arguing for ethnic uh, based uh, federalism, federalism, some of them might say that, you know, okay, positive discrimination should be based on terms of ethnicity, which is fine, but that's not the only coordinate. Another coordinate is class. For example, mm -hmm. you know, some people mm -hmm. uh, in the ethnic community, they might be coming to coming from very upper classes, upper, yeah. you know, and some of the bounds are very poor. Mm -hmm. And again, another coordinate would be gender. Gender, women also, untouchable caste uh, also. Dalits, you know, yeah. they are the, you know, they have, uh, Born the bob, uh, brunt, you know that yeah, the, the main the brunt of the impact yeah. of this this kind of discrimination, this kind of structural violence for centuries. Mm -hmm. So they are at the very bottom. So these multiple factors, that of gender, that of class, that of ethnicity, mm -hmm. and ability also. What if a person is a disabled person? He does not have a leg, or he, if he cannot see, is isn't he suffering from some kind of yeah. uh, uh, violence? So Dr. that should also be addressed. Dr. Upriti, let me link your logic or reason to the national politics. We are expecting the new constitution. However, political parties are trying to promulgate new constitution. They have already failed so many years. Almost yeah. they may take like one decade. Mm -hmm. What do you think? On the one hand, we see that political parties are bigger over the identity, the issue of identity. 
that may be the most contentious issues in constitution making process. On the one hand, in the national politics, in fact, even Maoist and Modest centric political parties, they are arguing for identity based federal states, as we said. And on the other hand, Nepali Congress and CPN UML are arguing that such kind of identity based federal state would lead to disintegration and communal class. Are they seriously talking about that or this is only their political motto, motto or political uh, politics only politics? Yeah? It's very difficult for me to answer this question because you know so much, so many people are saying so many things about it. It's very difficult to separate what is fact and what is fiction. Whether it is only political rhetoric, are they really serious about it? Because we have been listening to this rhetoric for such a long time. So it's honestly speaking, it's very difficult for me to say you know what is what. But <laughs> but uh, in general, is what I think is that both of these groups, they have to leave these extreme positions and before that, I would like to ask another them. question. You are also theatre actor. Does it mean that we cannot uh, separate between what is they performing or they are doing in reality? <laughs> it's very difficult. You know, like sometimes it's very difficult, you know, like because politics is also a kind of a stage. You are performing on a kind of a national stage. So it becomes very difficult to distinguish what is reality and what is performance. You know, like when you, when I look at the political species of the leaders to a, to a to many times, you know, like sometimes I feel that you know, this kind of a performance, you know. But still, we have to speak because it is time to speak out. Of course, yeah. the constitution that they are promulgating does not only affect this generation; also, it may affect new, new next generation, one to three, one or two, three generation. Yeah. That's we have. That's why we have to speak out. Of and course. Let me ask one political question to you. If you give logic to one point, which is better? I am not asking which is the best. Which is better? Delineate federal states in ethnic lines or just forget ethnic lines and delineate federal states? Which one you is know, better? One, one, uh, somehow, somehow you know, one has to find a compromise, especially given the situation as it is. I mean, wha at one hand, and as I've already told you, yeah. there is a lot of dissatisfaction among the various ethnic groups, but not mm -hmm. only ethnic groups, among the Dalits, among the women and all that. So their issues, you know, like the, the dissatisfaction they have, the discrimination they have faced, that must be addressed. If it cannot be addressed, then the democracy will, we will have it won't be a true democracy. It cannot be a democracy where, you know, half of the people, more than half of the people are at the bottom and other some people are enjoying it, the benefits which comes to them automatically yeah. at the top. That cannot be, that can be only be a sham democracy. Mm -hmm. So that needs to be addressed. But on the other hand, you know, like, uh, the thing is, you know, like, uh, uh, I feel I see that a lot of political rhetoric is going on from yeah. the uh, leaders of the ethnic groups also sometimes. You know, sometimes very violent, you know, like rhetoric. The idea that you know, like all bound chhatri and bad, and they are yeah. exploiting us equally. Mm -hmm. That kind of political rhetoric is not also good. Then we have to link this class and identity together in Nepal in the context of Nepal. Eh? Of course, you know, like they they come together. As I said, you know, like you mm. cannot separate these things. You know, like if you want to look at the question of ethnicity, you have also have to look at the question of gender and class. Maybe mm. other factors also, but these are the three main things: mm. gender, class, and ethnicity. We have to take them three together. Even when you are formulating, yeah. and that day will come, I think. Even when we are formulating some kind of plans for, let like, let's say, positive discrimination or reservation, yeah. these factors should be taken together. You know. Mm -hmm. If you just take, so that, that's my, you know, like one of my reservations when people talk about just ethnic states. Yeah. That's one of my reservations. Because, you know, what, what will happen to women in that ethnic state? What will happen to the, what will happen to very poor untouchable people? Untouchable also in Untouchables in that yeah. state. Disabled people. Disabled people. Mm. So all these different kinds of marginalization, because marginalizations are not only of one kind, they are of multiple kinds. Mm. These multiple kinds of mar marginalizations. Sometimes double marginalization existed. also, maybe Madesi people and Madesi women, Madesi uh, lower caste, so called lower caste. Madesi women, Madesi, Madesi disabled. There are four fold, five fold discrimination. Of course, if, if there is a kind of a Madesi, Dalit woman. Yeah. Threefold discrimination is there? Of course, you know, she bears you know, much more kind of discrimination. That's why, as I was saying, so you know, one way to deal with it is to, rather than just looking at ethnicity or caste or gender, is to look at the human, there is something called human development index. Yeah. Which takes into account these multiple factors, you know, like, mm -hmm. so what kind of uh, development, you know, what's the, you know, that will, for example, child mortality rate. Yeah. Right? Or education, 
or health. So if you take these multiple things into account, then you can see that you know like there are multiple layers of these marginalizations mm -hmm. and any assistance, this any uh, attempt to make these kind of positive discrimination should address these multiple layers of marginalizations, yeah. which is which can be found out through this human development index. Yeah. Dr. Kriti, we are at the end of the pro program. Do you think the political parties, present political parties, existing political parties can resolve such kind of contentious issues? Oh, of course, you know, they have and to, they they, can, eventually, you know, they have to, at a certain point, I'm sure that, you know, common sense will prevail, you know, like, uh, they, they will be able to strike a compromise. And main thing is that you know, they have to look beyond their own party, caste, class yeah. interests and look beyond that and think of the entire nation. If they, if they have the political will to do, do that, this will certainly happen. The new constitution will be written. You are optimistic. Yes, still am. Okay, thank you, Dr. Rubidi, for joining us. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you, Sushant. Today, we have talked with Professor Dr. Sanjeev Upridi about identity politics. Thanks for watching. Stay with us. Goodbye. Namaste.